I'm Taylor Jackson, and this is my review of the Fuji X-T2. I am not endorsed or sponsored by Fuji. Uh, this was not a gift by Fuji. I bought this camera with my own money on release day. Um, I'm also not sponsored or endorsed by Nikon, so there is no behind the scenes motivation for me to push any product upon you. Uh, this is simply just helping you choose the correct tool for you. All right, the way this review is gonna go, first we're gonna focus on image quality. We're gonna compare this camera uh, in an unreasonable comparison to the Nikon D5. Uh, then we're gonna get into autofocus. We're gonna do a little bit about video. Uh, we're gonna go for a drive and just do some landscape shots. And then we're gonna do some high ISO portraits of my cat on the balcony. Her name is Penelope and she hates everyone. There's timestamps below if you wanna to skip to specific sections. And also there's a download link for all the raw files as well. The reason I got this camera is because I wanted something smaller to travel with. We do a travel and photography show. If you haven't checked that out, maybe do that. And I've never been a fan of bringing lots of lenses, uh, and the smaller the kit that I can bring, kind of the better. So this seems like the perfect option that gives me the quality that I need and a smaller, more compact package. And as always, I got this camera from BJ Photo. Um, also not endorsed by BJ Photo, but I just buy all my stuff there. They're a small family-run camera shop in Waterloo, Ontario. So if you're near Toronto, um, anywhere in Canada, maybe look them up next time you're in the market to buy, say, a Fuji X-T2. So thanks for watching. If you have any questions about this Fuji, uh, just put them in the comments below. If I can't answer them, there's lots of Fuji people that will be able to help you out um, and get you the correct answers to your questions to make sure that you make the right purchasing decision. Today we are doing one of the most unfair challenges of all time, the Fuji X-T2 versus the Nikon D5. Alright, so these are all the things I'm going to be using. Um, sorry for the ridiculous chopped off head frame. This is the Nikon 35mm f2.0. This is the Fuji 35mm f2.0. I'm going to be shooting that on crop mode inside this Nikon D5 uh, to give an accurate uh, field of view. And I'm also going to be trying this lens on here, uh, which is where the Metabones adapter comes in, um, just to test it, uh, just to see how these two lenses compare uh, to one another. And the 35 Tamron, just for my personal preference, I love the Tamron stabilized primes, uh, so I just, I just want to test it. Then I'm going to be testing this 35 here against the Nikon f1.2 50 millimeter lens. Um, this will not be on crop mode, this will be full frame. Mostly just kind of interested to see how, uh, how this 35 stacks up to something uh, that I think is pretty good. Beyond that, we have these zooms as well. Um, this is the 18 to 135 by Fuji. And then I have the 28 to 300, um, which is roughly kind of the same price point, same uh, kind of same zoom. This one goes a little, this one goes a little further. So hopefully all of that makes sense. We're going to go test it. This is kind of the best real world style example that I could do uh, that was kind of the most accurate. Obviously this isn't a clinical test. Um, I'm also not gonna be going pixel by pixel through all the photos. Um, it's more of just a, uh, kind of first impressions, how the raw files look. And I'm just interested to see if one like is clearly the standout lens. I'll be shooting all the primes at 2.8, um, which obviously does give this, uh, this 50 an advantage. And for the two zooms, I'll match the focal lengths as well. Uh, but do keep in mind that this is going to be full frame and this is going to be crop. So you're gonna get the same field of view um, in a slightly different way. Let's go take some pictures. <laughs> Now we're back in Lightroom and I'm just gonna have a look through the raw files here. You can download the raw files, there is a link in the description below uh, to these as well as the uh, images that came off the 18 to 135 on the Fuji and the uh, 28 to 300 on the Nikon. Um, I have some surprises here. The main surprise is how good this Fuji 35 F2 is. Um, I shot everything at 2.8, so it stopped down a little bit, which theoretically, uh, should make this look a heck of a lot better. Uh, this is the Nikon 35 F2 uh, on the Fuji X-T2, so it goes through the Metabones converter. Loses a little bit of quality that way, uh, but as you'll see as we get closer to the end of these, um, it looks a little bit better on the Nikon, but not a heck of a lot better. Uh, this Fuji lens is phenomenal. This is maybe the best lens that I've ever uh, seen. And uh, I guess coupled with the X-T2, it's really a incredibly powerful combination uh, and it's less than two thousand dollars for the kit so uh, if you're looking for something that is just phenomenal uh, definitely look into this kit this is uh, with the Tamron a little bit softer again going through the Metabones adapter to put it onto the Fuji uh, because it is a Nikon mount it's okay it's not great this is what I typically shoot um, I shoot the Tamron because it has VC uh, I do a lot of video handheld so I need the vibration control um, but obviously in image quality this Fuji uh, really 
really wins. This here is an Nikon 50mm f1.2. It is a manual focus lens, and in my mind, it was the sharpest and best lens uh, that uh, Nikon made, uh, that at least I had tried. And uh, I love this lens, and it looks fine. It's a little blue um, in comparison to the Fuji over here, but sharpness, pretty close. Um, but the more I look at it, the more the Fuji is just better, um, kind of all around. So uh, Fuji beats this Nikon F1.2 as well, uh, in my mind. They're close enough though, like in a real world scenario, it wouldn't matter which of these lenses you're shooting with, but the Fuji is smaller, a little bit lighter, and uh, the image quality is, in my opinion, a little bit better. Um, this Nikon here is made of metal, it's heavy, so if you want something with incredible build quality, go for this here. Um, but if you just want something easy, go for this guy. All right, so now these are images on the D5. Uh, it's scaled down a little bit just because I put the D5 into uh, crop mode to try to make it roughly similar. Um, so just using kind of the center part of the sensor, which may or may not be cheating. But even with cheating, this Fuji looks better than this guy here. The Nikon 35 F2 looks a little bit better on here um, in comparison. And lastly, uh, we have the Nikon 50mm f1.2. This is, uh, I turned off crop mode so that uh, they're both kind of 50mm equivalents roughly. And it looks pretty good. On its native camera, this Nikon 50 1.2 is a fantastic lens. Obviously download these files if this interests you, but in my opinion this Fuji has won this challenge for sure. And it also just kind of wins overall look and feel, there's no vignetting, uh, it's just a phenomenal lens. Alright, so switching over to the zooms, the 18-135 uh, the to Fuji and uh, the Nikon here as well. And I'm just going to do a quick comparison just of two files here. Um, as you can see, some incredible vignetting here um, on the Nikon. It looks a little muddier. Um, obviously it's a little bit underexposed, but uh, let's see what they look like. Huh. They're pretty good. They're both pretty good. Um, as far as sharpness goes. And this one is the last one I'm going to compare at uh, 135 on the Fuji here, which is roughly 200 equivalent. Um, again, heavy vignetting, um, but can be fixed in a couple clicks in Photoshop most of the time. I don't know, the Fuji's clearer, the Fuji looks generally better, uh, more appealing once you get close. Obviously this is at the end of the Fuji range, this is at 135, uh, whereas the Nikon has a little advantage here because it's at 200 and it still has 100 millimeter to zoom. But as far as image quality goes on this, um, definitely the Nikon wins. But they're both fine in the field. I wouldn't be too upset if I shot something with this Fuji 18-35. to It's a great lens. Um, apparently the kit lens is even better. Uh, I don't own that. I don't own a lot of Fuji things yet. Um, but we'll see how that progresses over the next couple months because that 35 is a phenomenal lens. So if you need the best 50mm lens equivalent, 35mm uh, in the world, uh, definitely get this Fuji because it is, um, it's fantastic. It's better, it is far better than I anticipated and I did have some high expectations of it going in. So, uh, very cool. Autofocus on the X-T2, I was a little bit nervous because I know that it's an electronic viewfinder and uh, statistically they are not the best at autofocus. However, I found that this electronic viewfinder is amazing. You can see everything, things actually look better in it than they do in real life, uh, which is kind of funny. And I thought that uh, the autofocus has been pretty good for, I would say, 98% of everything that I use. Um, obviously, if, if there's not enough contrast, uh, it doesn't know what to focus on, so it'll just give you a little exclamation point AF telling you that it didn't lock on anything. Uh, for high frame rates and uh, autofocus, I uh, went downstairs and I photographed some cars with a really busy background. 
And I tried all the autofocus modes. There's a bunch of different autofocus modes on the X-T2. Uh, however, I didn't really notice that a lot of them did perform drastically different. I found that just the multi-purpose one was usually the best. Um, and they all kind of suffered from the same problem. And that was basically that it would track perfectly fine leading up, but as soon as something was going away, something like this would happen where um, it would go out just for a few frames and then it would pop back. I wanted to get close enough so that uh, I could definitely see that the background was in fact out of focus because I know that it is a 50 millimeter equivalent f2 lens that uh, if I'm focused on infinity that an autofocus test is kind of useless but again same deal with this is that um, in focus in focus and out of focus um, probably the next frame if I would have stuck with this would have been back in and same with this guy and it falls out just for one frame right there and right back so again, if there's enough contrast, because there's quite a lot of contrast on these, um, my focus point was probably about here. Um, it was somewhere just like right dead center. And there's enough contrast for it to actually pick it up and focus on, um, which is kind of nice. So yeah, as you can see, uh, when you do actually look through the viewfinder, there is, um, it's kind of like a shutter. I don't know if it's a lag, but whenever it focuses on something, it kind of shakes and tremors a bit. It does get a little disorienting if you're trying to do something really fast, uh, if you're doing a lot of pictures. Uh, it just, it kind of moves a little bit more than it should, I think. And another issue is that the focus box is basically the size of this flower inside the uh, viewfinder, so that whenever you're trying to focus on just something like just the tips here, um, it doesn't really work out as well as it could, so you just kind of take a lot of frames. Um, so we got it there. One more high frame rate test here. Um, worked out pretty well. As long as there's an element that you can focus on, um, it will lock onto it. If it doesn't know uh, what you're trying to focus on because there is a bunch of different focal lengths within the square, uh, usually it just kind of picks one and goes with it, which I don't love. Uh, the manual focus override is not as easy as it is on a Nikon or a Canon. You can just uh, like make that adjustment yourself and hold down the focus lock. Uh, it's not that easy on this, um, a little more a little more challenging. But for the most part, the autofocus does do a pretty good job. And this is a picture of some weeds in some dirt chips that, uh, oh, this is a video. So overall, autofocus is great. If you are just doing daily life tasks or a typical like wedding event, you don't need anything more. But if you are doing something a little more like sports or something that requires um, obviously top of the line autofocus, uh, this will get pretty close, but I would recommend to rent it and try it in your specific niche uh, to make sure that it's right for you. The autofocus is more than good enough. Um, you'll have no issues with it under nor normal circumstances. And it is a lot better than I anticipated it being. And it is probably as good as my D5 in most circumstances. Here's a quick video test from the Fuji X-T2. As you can see, there is a lot of rolling shutter if you're not using any sort of stabilization. I do shoot a lot of handheld with VR lenses on Nikon, and they tend to be pretty good. If you are just going to be sticking this Fuji X-T2 on a tripod and pointing at a subject, obviously it will be okay. It'll be great at that. It'll do it in 4K. Awesome. If you're using it for any sort of documentary coverage, uh, especially handheld, there are better tools for this job. Uh, don't try to force this camera to do a thing that it shouldn't. There's a bunch of weird things with it. Whenever you change shutter speeds, it kind of flickers weird. Um, it's very not intuitive. Uh, if you're on any sort of auto mode, it's actually very awkward and clunky and kind of hard to do. And there's just so much rolling shutter that if you if you move or you pan, um, the frame just lays over. So there are definitely better tools out there. Uh, find one of those if you are serious about video. Um, if you're really serious about video, Sony is probably the right option if you're kind of on the fence and you haven't gone Fuji or Sony yet. Um, I would say that Fuji is much more for the photographers, Sony a little more for the video creators and makers. So those are my thoughts on it as somebody that does a lot of video. I'm about to take the X-T2 on a ride around the cliche countryside of Ontario, Canada, um, Mennonite country. First up is the most cliche country drive dirt road shot, so uh, I'm gonna go take that. All right, have it set to aperture priority. So, uh, so I don't really have to do a whole lot, and I think that's it. All right, back to the car. Next up we have the same dirt road uh, facing the opposite direction, so into the sun. Kinda wanna test the dynamic range in a real world setting uh, that I might find myself in. Uh, doing travel photography and whatnot, so let's do that. All right, let's get back to the computer and look at these in Lightroom. 
Now you might be saying that this picture looks flat and or lifeless and boring. Uh, the composition is boring, the subject matter is pretty boring, but I think that there's a lot of hidden information in this sky. Uh, from what I noticed was that it was just really picking up, that's not the way to do it. Um, we're gonna go with dehaze. I bet that there's a lot hiding in there. Look at how good that looks. Just a little, an excessive amount of dehaze. Um, but look at how much sky is in here. That if you took the time to properly integrate this into the scene and make it work with this, uh, this could actually be like a reasonably good photo. Like this looks, this looks like a fake sky. Um, there's a little grain in there. Um, I guess 100% dehaze is, uh, is not recommended by uh, the Surgeon General. But like, look at how good this image could look. Um, and this is just a boring, stupid picture of a field. Disclaimer, never do 100% dehaze. Ah, but it looks, it looks good. I don't know, do what you want, do what's in your heart. Um, so flipping through a few of the other pictures, uh, this was one that I was kind of interested in. This is shooting right into, again, dehaze. It's a nice, it's a nice setting, I'm glad that it exists. Um, shooting into the sun, I was a little intrigued how it would, uh, how this camera would respond. But it looks pretty good for the most part. Um, just crank up the shadows and bring down the highlights. This is a real sloppy job, but I just kind of want to show what could be possible with this. Like, it's starting to look like an okay photo. Um, I know that photos should be a little more natural uh, straight out of camera. But I'm just kind of showing how much you can do to the files here. Uh, there's one specifically that I shot with it in mind to see. Um, so I shot this as close to kind of black as possible because I wanted to know how much was there. Uh, and even when you're exposing for the sky, let's do a lot to this and really, uh, really test the limitations. Like. It's starting to look pretty remarkable already. And then bring one of these down. Like if you're a landscape photographer, you almost have infinite abilities here with this. Um, Obviously, this is a little over-edited. Um, maybe uh, I probably wouldn't go this far ever in uh, while editing photos. Let me click that one. Okay, we're gonna leave it as that. Um, obviously, not an edit that you would probably do to your photo, but when it began as that, and you can turn it into that in a couple of seconds, um, it's kind of cool. Some photos of the skies. Um, obviously, if you can't tell, uh, one of the things that I love about this camera is how it captures skies and that it retains so much of that detail. So, uh, like, look at that. There's just there's so much in there in that one raw file. Um, obviously, you have to get the right lighting conditions and everything, but I don't know. That's just like there's just a lot in there for such a small camera and such an underpriced camera as well. Um, just the quality that you get from it. And that 35 millimeter lens is, uh, it's fantastic. All right, so that's about it for that. Um, one thing that I'm gonna to touch on really quick here is that for portrait work, the way that I usually work, I'm super fast, take lots of pictures. Oh, that's great. Um, and like move locations as fast as possible to kind of keep people from getting awkward because I know that I get really awkward if I have to stand somewhere and spend too, too long in a location. I know some photographers are the exact opposite of that that will spend 20 minutes inside a radius of like 20 feet and will get so many amazing shots. I'm not like that. I like to move around. I like to go for walks, talk to people, um, keep people kind of the energy going. I like to be a little bit more on a journey. And for that reason, this camera is not so good for me yet. Just shooting really fast with it. Having the electronic viewfinder, there's a lot of, um, like it'll pop back and then it'll lag out and then it'll skip. 
But just moving quickly, uh, the viewfinder just doesn't keep up to how fast I'm usually working. I did give it a chance, I will give it another chance. Unless you're more of a static shooter, um, finding one location, really using that location, framing things properly, um, spending lots of time making sure that everything's exactly right. Um, mine is more the energy and momentum of the shoot that kind of carries me through. I'm not used to dealing with professional models, so uh, if I make people stand there, they get awkward. And that's what I like to avoid. And for that reason, the Fuji will not work for me. But for landscapes, uh, specifically for skies, obviously, uh, Fuji's kind of killing the game here. And I know it might be lame to go off on how awesome the skies are, but like, that looks pretty freaking cool. And that, it, that looks much better than it did in real life. And it doesn't even look over-processed. It looks like a natural thing that could have happened, um, well, it did happen. It just required 59 points of dehaze. Um, so that's kind of, that's more how it looked in real life. It was looking like something like that. And then with just like, yeah, this is a great camera for landscapes, great colors, great detail, great sharpness, landscapes. Not sure what just happened, but it locked up. Um, I can't turn it off on. Just been writing for about three minutes now. It's been a few minutes, it's still uh, still locked up, so I'm gonna do a battery pull on a camera, which is a thing that I've never had to do. Um, thought you only had to do those on Blackberries, but uh, apparently today. Tonight we're gonna be taking pictures of Penelope, AKA Princess for President, official if you're on Instagram. I'm not going to be doing side-by-side -side comparisons with the cameras. I basically just want to see a real-world example if this looks good enough to use. From what I saw, I knew that it was going to be pretty good, but after taking these pictures, I realized that it's, uh, it's a lot better than really good. So this is at 3200 ISO. Um, this is the 35mm f2.0 uh, lens stopped down to 3.6 for some reason. As you can see, phenomenal detail at 3200 ISO. Uh, this is, this far exceeds any expectations that I had. Uh, switching over to, this is shot at uh, f2.0, which is wide open on this lens. And still, you get a little bit of purple, but the detail in here is still really, really, really good. All right, heading up to 12,800 ISO. Um, again, once it actually loads, it looks so good. Like everything is well defined. In the out of focus elements, obviously it gets a little little grainy, uh, but quite honestly, the grain on this Fuji is actually really nice, and it feels a little a lot more film like than uh, than my Nikon does, and it kind of keeps all the grain here to a monochromatic rather than making like random colors and things like that that some cameras do. And uh, for the last one here, still at 12,800 ISO, and uh, just all the detail. Uh, it's just so good. This, all the autofocus elements look great. This just looks fantastic. I'm super happy with this. Uh, it's incredible that a lens and camera that can cost less than $2,000 can deliver performance like this, low light, at night, really, really great. One interesting thing is that this is the, uh, the film simulation that I was running, and it was a little bit orange, and when I was seeing it on the LCD, I was like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to like this. Uh, but then as soon as I loaded them into Photoshop, this was just the default. So uh, clearly, if you're getting some weird results, maybe uh, play around with your film simulation. It's just one of the default ones, but it's obviously a lot more orange. Um, it uh, brings the blacks down a lot more, too, uh, whereas these just kind of open up. Again, this is an entirely unedited uh, image. If you wanted to edit it a bit, I'm sure you could, and I'm sure it would look even better. Something like that. That can go on the Princess for President uh, official. Like there's, um, even after you've played with it, the grain kicks up a little bit obviously because you're editing kind of a high ISO file, but the detail and everything just still sticks around. Really phenomenal camera. Um, another little high ISO test. Lindsay gives these out to her wedding clients whenever they uh, get their photos delivered. All right. 
So this is at 3200. Really, really good. This is at 6400. Again, really, really good. <laughs> like, an incredible amount of detail for such high ISO. I remember times that I couldn't shoot more than 800 ISO. And I had to walk uphill both ways to weddings. And the last one at 12,800 ISO. Uh, obviously starts to get a little, little noisier, but the detail still is fantastic. You can see all the little imprints in the label. And so that concludes the, uh, the cat test of this Fuji X-T2. I uh, hopefully you enjoyed this. If you like this, uh, check out the other tests that we did on this uh, Fuji X-T2, because it's a phenomenal camera. And uh, if you're looking at this review, you're probably interested in buying one. And uh, I would not steer you away from that. That sounds like a good decision. The cat photos from this camera are fantastic. One thing we haven't actually talked about yet is uh, how it feels to actually take a picture with this camera. And while there are a lot of new things to learn, it is also a very simple machine, which I appreciate. I really love the dials up here for your shutter speed and your ISO. Uh, if you're shooting aperture priority, it's really nice to have the um, exposure compensation kind of right there. Uh, another cool thing is that when you look through the electronic viewfinder, which I actually do really like, by the way, um, I know I gave it a hard time because when I'm shooting really fast in a portrait environment, uh, engaged in session wedding, um, it will not meet my standards. But for everything else, it really does make the world look a heck of a lot cooler. It's really nice that you can load your film presets in and whatever one you have selected is now how you're seeing the world. So you basically influence your reality through here, uh, which is pretty cool. And it's um, I don't know, almost this virtual environment because you're kind of closed off from outside and whatever. I'm sure the vanity of that will wear off soon. But for now, it's pretty cool. This versus a regular SLR, I highly prefer the feeling of this in my hands. I like that it's really customizable with two front and back wheels here. And you, on most lenses, you have your aperture right here. So you can select it um, manually as well as shutter speeds and things like that. I don't really know what else to say. Uh, it is a simple camera that does an incredibly good job at being a camera for photography. Um, the only thing that I don't love is the video function of this. And I also don't love that uh, to get into the video mode, you have to use this little small switch and you have to put it all the way around here uh, to get into video mode. So I don't love that, but everything else about this camera when it comes to just photography, I absolutely love. Um, I especially love this lens. This is my favorite lens uh, I think that I've found in the history of my life. Like, look at how small it is. It's incredibly small, incredibly sharp. And if you are picking up an X-T2, I highly recommend that you get this lens with it. I think I'm just going to end it there. We've been through a lot over this past half hour. Uh, this started out as a little three or four minute review and got wildly out of control. So thanks for sticking with it. I hope that this does help you. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I am not owned by Fuji or Nikon or anyone. Um, I just want kind of good information out there. And if you shoot anything like me, um, hopefully you connected with kind of all the content in here and you realize that even though I don't do things 100% technically correct sometimes, um, that you understand why I do those things. Thanks for watching this review all the way to the end. Uh, I am Taylor Jackson, and if uh, you'd like to see more of me, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We also do a travel and photography show, so uh, season two of that's gonna start up pretty soon. We're going on an African safari, uh, hopefully we're going to Antarctica, all kinds of crazy stuff, so, uh, so please watch that. Uh, thanks again for watching, and hopefully this helped you make a more informed decision of whether or not you're gonna buy this camera.